सो वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून अजय जी एंड गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई एम कॉलिंग माय प्रेजेंटेशन एक्ट फोर द टू रीजंस टू कॉल दैट वन इज दैट अपरेंटली देर ओनली फोर नंबर्स इन द वर्ल्ड वन टू थ्री एंड मेनी सो इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू डाइजेस्ट अ लिस्ट ऑफ फोर्टीन एंड एंड दैट्स वेयर देन वी get into difficulty in terms of how do we therefore resolve them and so my talk will have many fours and now agenda for amrit kal this is the fourth quarter century we have finished three of the quarter centuries and therefore also the fourth perspective and act is four aspirations four conundrums that we need to deal with i mean obviously agriculture has this 14 and many more issues and if you have to try and talk about them in a capsule uh it's useful to understand what these conundrums are it's it's actually many solutions are known uh, i started my career in agriculture exactly 41 years ago situation was slightly different but for the last 25 years at least the third quarter century what we were talking today is what you we were talking at that time perhaps climate change was not spoken as much as we are talking today but everything else was spoken 25 years ago also and therefore what are those four conundrums which are holding us back from executing many of those solutions that have been spoken about and the t is just as four thoughts uh, to deal with this conundrums and on a path towards those four aspirations what is it that one could possibly do uh, uh, that's a debate that uh, one could have so if you have to look back before we look forward uh, very briefly what is indian agriculture in the last three quarter centuries it's obviously a story of some notable accomplishments but there are several serious challenges also some of that we already heard it's it's a big paradox that one looks at at what have we been able to accomplish and yet what are we staring at I mean among accomplishment obviously food self sufficiency in whichever manner that you measure we have accomplished not only just self sufficiency but sizable exports 40 50 60 billion dollars plus minus in that range and it's good or bad i don't know but agriculture provides livelihood for 45% of people as a primary source of income uh, it's good because that's a single largest workforce bad because among the challenges side we see that despite all these accomplishments the farmer incomes are very low low farmer incomes if you just look at uh, gross value added gdp or number of people involved and therefore per capita from many of these kind of calculations so agriculture per capita is less than a fourth of rest of the country so that's a big issue depleting natural resources we already heard about water and top soil equally and the threat of climate change is obviously the the biggest elephant in the room uh, and therefore these are the kind of issues that one has to look at and therefore if you have to say what is the aspiration that we have for this amrit kal and over the next several years I mean actually uh, at at an overall economy level imf has forecasted that in the next 5 years starting already last year in that sense uh, when our amrit kal also started uh, next 5 years India's contribution to world's growth in GDP is 18 percent. Obviously, many other economies are not growing as well. India continues to grow, and but are we taking agriculture more importantly our farmers along? Is therefore uh, an issue, and therefore the very first aspiration as part of this Amrit Kal would be it's more profitable and remunerative for the farmers. 
if agriculture prospers and farmers remain poor, it, it won't make sense. So therefore, that is one. And in order to raise the prosperity of farmers, the second aspiration is that we need to be more competitive and competitive from a global perspective. Yeah, quite often we talked about whether prices should go up, whether productivity should go up and all of that. But each of them have their own corollary in terms of problems. Productivity goes up. Where are the markets for that? For the corresponding quality and so on. And therefore, when you say globally competitive, it has to be of that type of product and those specs which are going to be in demand. And given that we are roughly well balanced as an economy, plus minus a few percentage points in terms of our demand versus supply of several of agriculture crop and food products and other stuff. Export has to be an important avenue for raising farmers' incomes and the larger economic growth. And therefore, the second aspiration is in being more competitive so that we are able to increase exports and particularly of high-value products. It's, it's not a big deal to say that you know, for three years, uh, some commodity is lying uh, in warehouses and because now we don't have empty warehouses. Therefore, we need to export something. That's not really the value added. There is enormous amount of scope in terms of what that is. The third is uh, we need to be obviously more innovative because number of technologies exist, both in terms of agricultural technologies, uh, uh, seeds, agronomy, many things, and in the new age, digital technologies and going forward even more AI and all that. And how do we leverage all of them uh, and bring them also into uh, agriculture? And the fourth aspiration is that we need to do all this in a more sustainable fashion, that we need to build climate resilience and certainly agriculture not just build resilience, but can also contribute to mitigation of the larger problem that the world is facing. Now, these aspirations obviously are well known, whether you can state three, four, five, many people have done this for many years. But the conundrums that we need to tackle in a, in a different frame, as he has talked about what is in control, what is not in our control. And it's a paraphrasing of some of that when I bring in, when I say we need to be more remunerative and profitable to the farmers, the question really is that how do we bring the power of scale to the small farmers? Because largest of our farmers also will be small in the global context. And therefore, how do we bring the power of scale to the small? That itself is a uh, uh, conundrum and therefore we need to find a solution uh, for dealing with that. We need to be more competitive. Global markets is the second aspiration I talked about. But there is an inherent conflict and that's the reason of the uh, policy changes in not just recent past, for many years in the past also, that there is an inherent conflict between domestic food security, consumer prices, and maintaining a stable policy uh, for trade at the other end to increase exports. I mean, how do you creatively balance both? Uh, I mean, each of these conundrums basically means if you solve them, it's literally you are having your cake and eating it also. I mean, how do you solve that? That's the issue. That I need to export uh, to raise prices and get higher incomes for the farmers and possibly through value addition. And yet, I need to keep prices because the consumer prices is a bigger challenge uh, for governments and political economy than farmer prices. And, and therefore, how do you really balance uh, these and not have knee-jerk on an ongoing basis? In terms of more innovative and leveraging technologies, while of course, uh, the, the all technologies related agriculture itself have been there for a while and some of that has moved in to the farmers, the more recent phenomenon is agri-tech startups which are trying to bring much of this to the farmers. They are showing promise in what they have already achieved. But the conundrum is how do we convert that into more money in the hands of farmers and at scale? If you walk around, uh, there are at least 1,500 agri-tech startups. I mean, yesterday I saw some, but it released there 7,000 startups apparently. I haven't seen so many, but there may be many of that kind also somewhere that, I mean, obviously one doesn't see everything, but that's also a large number. And even if you speak to a couple of hundred, 250 of them that I would have personally met, each of them are so impressive in terms of what they are uh, doing. But 
how do you translate that into more money in the hands of farmers and doing it on scale I mean, doing it for a thousand farmers five thousand fifty thousand hundred thousand farmers is not going to move the needle so that's the other conundrum in terms of climate resilience and sustainability a lot of work is happening at a macro level uh, in terms of forecasts in terms of uh, resilience and all of that but at the same time the conundrum is how do we protect the crop for individual small farmers in extreme weather conditions when there is too much of rain in one day, half a day, whatever period, then how do I protect uh, the crop? Hailstorm, how do I protect? Now, how do you translate this macro work on climate change down to micro? Now, these are the four conundrums that the solution seems to be visible, but how do you actually translate keeping these reality in mind uh, is the uh, four C's. Now, my thoughts on what possibly we can do and in sense, all four of them are where as ITC, we are putting our foot where our mouth is and therefore we believe in them and therefore we are doing it and, uh, and that's what I am sharing and uh, open for what else could be done, how else it could be done uh, because this, this is a journey. Yeah. And let me now deal with what possibly can be done or what we are doing in the reverse order. Uh, of these four uh, conundrums, starting with the climate change, uh, like I said, is the biggest uh, elephant in the room. The, the attempt uh, that we have been making uh, is, uh, you know, there are forecasts on what is going to happen to whether uh, there are multiple scenarios built as part of the IPCC construct globally, and there are uh, forecasts visible for the next until actually 2100 the end of this century so what we have done is picking up with the help of uh, an ai startup picking up the underlying data of these uh, for climate forecast models and try and optimize that for micro growing zones that at a district level uh, as the current uh, data that is available from India. And actually, you've done it also a few other countries because you're talking about global markets, competing origins, destination markets, and all of that. And so optimizing these forecasts as to what probably the uh, best forecast for these micro regions, which are as a decadal climate forecast models, you know, what will it be in 2030 and 40, 50, 60, and so on. And then we picked up the crops of interest for India. We deal in about 20 crop value chains. We picked up about 12 of them, uh, which are relevant from a major export context or also import context. And for each of these crops, if there are five or six important phenological stages of that crop. Now, for those phenological stages of the crop, some of these extreme weather events are more likely to be having higher impact. If there is a heat stress, one crop suffers a lot more at the time of planting, another crop suffers a lot more at a grain formation stage or something else at a harvesting stage. So, and similarly rain and uh, similarly very low temperatures and uh, those kinds of things. So picking up these extreme weather events, which is likely to have a higher impact for each of these phenological stages. And now superimpose that with the decadal climate forecasts which are done to identify what are the yield and quality risks? One is the yield and second is the quality risk, which is also there. Yield may be there and but quality may suffer based on these forecasts. Now that is then used to specify the research briefs. There is of course research briefs which are created saying that now we want climate resilient seed and climate resilience means ABC. So all of that is of course their research agenda is driven like that. But these forecasts specifically built like this are helping in terms of preparing research briefs for both breeding and other agronomy practices so that you are informed on a decadal forecast for uh, the next several years. And then based on what we know already and what additional inputs are coming from these kind of research briefs, you build what we are calling as weather resilient toolkits with these agronomy practices and then get short-term weather forecasts as well. 
every season there are short term weather forecast there are micro local weather forecast all of that is happening so based on these short term weather forecast how do you get to disseminate these to the farmers so you are at one end becoming more precise in terms of how you are using some of these toolkits on top of micro segmenting growth zone for specific crops so that is one exercise that we are doing and to some extent this can possibly deal with the the climate change conundrum how do you translate all of this work is already happening what what we call this is uh, a combinatorial innovation so we are not inventing anything new here ourselves it is just that many things are happening in the ecosystem put them all together but farmer as the center and then take it there so that those things and in turn obviously it helps us because it manages the risk in our own supply chain and consequently it benefits us and simultaneously of course in any case there are no regret sustainable practices that we must popularize independent of all this whether it's micro irrigation whether it is zero till or mulching cover crops all of these are relevant in different crops and different zones so that must happen in any case as a no regret solution uh, and the precision is the other this thing the second in terms of connecting many point solutions to the farmers and make it actionable uh, that is the issue i talked about a host of agri techs a host of other agri uh, technologies a host of other uh, agronomy interventions many things uh, that exist now because many of these are exciting but they are point solutions if i get an ideal micro regional weather forecast now as a farmer what do i do with it until i have a recommendation therefore what now that in turn will then say okay now if this is what i need to do if it requires a machine uh, how do i get access to that machine uh, if i want to be an entrepreneur who want to do it for 100 other farmers by doing it where is access to credit and and so on and so forth uh, across the whole chain so while each of these solve the problems very well by themselves again they don't translate into more money in the hands of farmers and therefore you require solution integrators one is the farmers require personalized solutions but farmers also need end to end solution that if there is a a best practice advocated for my agroclimatic zone for the crop that i have is it the right practice for me is a question typically that exists that if i want to invest less money if i have uh, you planted this crop in my last season or if uh, whatever else i am doing differently compared to my next door farmer should i still do the same best practice or is there a different right practice that is more applicable to me and so therefore the earlier description of end to end as well as this personalizes uh, what needs to happen and what now the digital technologies enable is bringing all these agritech startups agri input companies equipment manufacturers or whatever onto the same platform as together you can deliver the solution for the farmer at farmer at the center to say that okay i have three weather forecast company on my platform i have 40 farm input companies i have five banks and so on and so forth that all of them as far as the farmer is concerned it's a seamless solution and that is what is in the, in the management jargon called a meta market that product markets are disconnected from the consumer uh, needs a very simple example is when you say i want to Uh, by by a car now the natural issue there is in terms of where do i get credit how do i do my insurance how do i select across multiple models that are available so for each of these typically one had to in the past run from pillar to post but today there is a credit agency sitting in the automobile store and there is also an insurance person who sitting there that's how it is all converted into a one stop shop as a solution for us or if you do e-commerce logistics is integrated with banking solution which is integrated with the goods and multiple choice so it's the same issue here also in terms of how do you get all of these different things onto one platform so that together it becomes a solution and uh, so that's what we are also doing as uh, the name branding we have given as itc mars uh, 
uh, Mars has an acronym standing for Meta Market for Advanced Agriculture and Rural Services, uh, with with a host of these uh, uh, different organizations that are doing. As the so, how do you get more solution? And, and of course, it can only work when the solution integrators identify a business model as to how do I make it work and generate profit out of it while uh, farmer benefits out of it. And that's the meta market model uh, that can possibly solve that kind of a uh, conundrum. The third piece is really in terms of how do I balance between the domestic prices and exports. Also keeping in mind that the value added market for international requires the specifications and attributes and all of that which can fetch higher prices when they are more demand responsive and not exporting surplus of what we have in terms of what kind of uh, attribute whether it is a protein or a curcumin or heat or freshness whatever may be the attribute that one is looking at and on top of that the issues in terms of your uh, contamination and many of those elements. So each market has its own needs for each crop. And how do you create a demand responsive supply chain? And in order to apply the earlier solution of a digital integration as a solution in one place, as a cluster, it becomes far more easy. And that cluster can potentially be evolving to supply this quality produced for that market that is identified. So therefore, if it is a demand responsive supply chain as opposed to surplus exporting, combined with the other solution of bringing those practices and technologies and make it competitive and converging everything that is happening, whether it is logistics and everything in those clusters. And if these clusters are what is kept outside the uh, purview of many controls that we have, then you can create what are called the alternative supply chains. Eventually, the whole country can get there, but it can happen in stages. You see the benefit of alternate supply chains. It is demand responsive, more exports and more income for the farmers, and it is not impacting the domestic market. And uh, first of these conversations already uh, got triggered when Quad was established between India, US, Israel, and UAE. Uh, they are still fructify, and uh, uh, the actual uh, thing has to happen. But at least the governments have said, yeah, if this is the case, and if this is the kind of investment coming in, uh, then we can converge government schemes. We can look at Essential Commodity Act exemption and those kinds of things. So creating alternative supply chains parallelly for some time as we as examples until such time we really see that the benefits can then expand everywhere can see that you can balance so long as there are surplus production that is happening there is an argument to say that okay don't impose restrictions there <coughs> and in any case they have a far higher value if that's what you're producing with the demand responsive uh, and there is a joint investment that are happening from the customer side a routine trade transaction uh, is unlikely to get to the kind of a scale that we are talking about an alternative supply chain built with uh, longer term contracts uh, with the customers and uh, investment for developing the productivity, quality and logistics and all of that it is how it's, it's simply put another manner. It's like outsourcing IT services into India. Uh, IT work used to happen elsewhere in the world in their own. It's some of the business processes are outsourced to India and now it's a thriving business. In a very similar manner, outsourcing high quality food production or whatever non-food reasons that may be there to India, you have 50% of global capability centers in IT exist in India today, about 1600 of them. And businesses, services of the world's airlines, banks, consumer goods companies, the who is who of the world, the services are done from here. There is no reason as to why the who is who of the world's food production cannot happen from India, but it requires an alternate supply chain. It can't be the transaction-based uh, kind of export models. That's alternate supply chain, uh, the the, <coughs> the quad or I2U2 framework as it is called. Uh, there is some progress and uh, as it evolves, uh, 
uh, we will know how this fructifies. The last bit is bringing Parov's case to the small. Uh, obviously, producers' collectives is uh, in, in some sense no escape from that. Uh, the, the first seven years uh, of my career, I worked in Farmers Cooperative and next 35 years, I believe we are still in a cooperative but not necessarily a legal cooperative. How do you create a virtual cooperative? But issue is in what form you collect and then how do you ensure that this reaches me? We have a flavor of the day every few uh, years. Sometimes it is FPO, sometimes it is SSGs, or sometimes it is you know, multi-purpose cooperatives and all that and all the government policies and schemes keep shifting. Now the priority is here and in, in that process, the establishment of uh, the collectives as business in their own right, we haven't seen more than possibly uh, 5, 7, 8 percent of uh, collectives really succeeding. Uh, and But that's an opportunity uh, that still exists and uh, right now with the flavor of the day being FPO uh, is also an act as part of ITC marks. We have uh, integrated uh, FPOs but because one of the bigger problems of FPOs has been how do you link with market and because we are starting with market as demand responsive chains, uh, the success rate of the FPOs that are integrated with the ITC Mars is far higher by third year typically they are thriving. Yeah. It takes time for capacity building for all of that kind of work but uh, that's the route. So irrespective of what the legal form is, if the support uh, for integrating them into ecosystem, uh, that's a route that one could take. So, so these are the four thoughts uh, that I have for each of the four conundrums and uh, hope that some of these uh, show us the path for the Amrit Kal and, and like we have done in the past, we are always open for inputs in terms of how well this can be structured and so it's, it's like I said, put the foot where a mouth is rather than saying okay, these are the ideas for somebody else to do uh, and uh, because we see business opportunity for us. As someone said, the India's consumption itself is going to double once more in the next seven years. So that's the opportunity that we would like to participate as uh, a branded company and these are supply chains that are so therefore, it's in our own enlightened self-interest that this business opportunity that exists and uh, that, that's the future that I am seeing for agriculture. Thank you. <laughs>